Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Aliza Lustig, and I am on the National Climate Assessment Team at the U.S. Global Change Research Program, or USGCRP. Um, before we get started today, I want to draw your attention to a note that is in the chat or that will soon be in the chat. Um, microphones are disabled for all participants today during the webinar, but if you have questions or if you have comments throughout today's session, please enter them in the chat and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. If you have any difficulties today, please contact Aaron Grade, who is our technical support person. Please also note that all participants are expected to be respectful and considerate towards others per the USGCRP Code of Conduct. Next slide, please. Alrighty, so I'm gonna kick off the webinar with some background information about the National Climate Assessment before turning it over to the COAST's team chapter authors. The U.S. Global Change Research Program was mandated by Congress in the U.S. Global Change Research Act of 1990 to do just as it says on the slide, to assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. So USGCRP convenes 15 agencies to advance uh, climate and global change science, and to provide useful and usable information to decision makers. The 15 agencies included in the program are noted here with their seal. Next slide, please. Okay, so the same law that established the program also mandates a periodic scientific assessment that we call the National Climate Assessment or the NCA. Uh, the NCA is a quadrennial report. It analyzes the effects of global change on several sectors um, that are listed here the natural environment, agriculture, energy, land and water resources, transportation, human health, social systems, and biodiversity. USGCRP is charged with assessing current trends, as well as projections for the next 25 to 100 years. Um, the NCA is used by organizations and individuals for a variety of purposes, including national policymaking, risk management um, in the private sector, local mitigation, adaptation planning, um, as well as by practitioners, utility managers, and educators. So this slide here talks to you a little bit about um, some of the basics underlying the assessment. First and foremost, NCA authors review a very large body of scientific research from diverse information sources. They synthesize that information, they examine the confidence in their scientific understanding, and they evaluate uncertainty. NCA 5, this assessment, was written by 500 authors and 260 technical contributors from every single state in the country, as well as Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, and Palau. The NCA is designed to be policy relevant, so authors are distilling their findings into accessible language um, that is framed around risk to people and to important resources. But that said, the report is strictly not policy prescriptive, so is not advocating for a particular viewpoint or policy measure. And to that, you know, uh, along those lines, the NCA is using a range of future projections to help decision makers understand the fullest extent of possible risk that can be avoided or reduced under different climate scenarios. And then we leave it up to the decision maker to ultimately determine their own risk threshold. Um, the assessment is, of course, compliant with all applicable federal laws and policies. That includes the, the founding law, the Global Change Research Act, but it also includes other laws that govern things like information quality, accessibility, transparency, et cetera. And uh, finally, the report includes, as the authors can attest, um, an extensive review process, including several opportunities for public engagement, um, a review by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and several government science reviews. Next slide. Okay, so... Now let's take a look at the NCA5 table of contents. Like um, you know, the previous NCAs, we are covering national level topics, regions, and response actions. So we, we open with the overview chapter, which is followed by two chapters dedicated to the physical science of climate change. Then we get to those national topic chapters, um, including of course, the coastal effects chapter. Um, we have 10 regional chapters and then two response chapters Although it's important to point out that response actions are also discussed throughout the report, including, of course, the Coast's chapter. Um, this table of contents, the NCA table of contents, has evolved over time, and that is partially informed by user input. 
Um, so this time around, we added two new chapters, one on economics and one on social systems and justice, highlighted here in blue. And we also have five new focus features. Um, that is critical for this webinar because we are actually covering one of them here, the blue carbon focus box. But we also talk about compound extreme events, Western wildfire, COVID-19, and supply chains. Um, we have several appendices, of course, including one new one dedicated to indicators of climate change. Okay, so now that we have gone through some of the introductory background, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Mark Hostler, um, who is the federal coordinating lead author of the Coast chapter, and Chris May, the chapter lead, um, who will lead us through the remainder of the webinar today. Um, thank you both, and over to you, Mark. Thank you, Eliza. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Osler. I work at NOAA on coastal resilience issues and was proud to contribute to this effort as a federal coordinating lead author for this coast chapter alongside uh, Dr. Hillary Stockton from the US Geological Survey. Um, our coast nation's coastal counties produce nine and a half trillion dollars in goods and services each year, accounting for roughly 40% of our nation's GDP over 90% of US domestic goods are reliant on our ports and maritime industries at some point within their supply chain. And 40% of our nation's population lives in a coastal county. More than 50 million of these people being classified as sitting within an elevated risk status, be they children, elderly, or underserved. And in short, our coastlines are vital to our nation's economic, environmental, and social well being. The pace of environmental change at the coast and the impacts of this change are unmatched. Our national response to these changes touches on every sector of civil society. And as Elisa noted, the National Climate Assessment is silent on specific policy action in the face of this change. But the Climate Assessment is a critical national resource for authoritative science, which itself serves as the foundation for enabling sound public policy and risk-informed decision-making. I'm particularly proud of the work that happened in this chapter under the leadership of Dr. Chris May. I'm pleased to pass it over to her to continue with the briefing. Thank you, Mark. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Dr. Chris May. I am with the Pathways Climate Institute, uh, and it has been my honor to lead this chapter team over the past three or four years. Um, climate impacts along our coasts um, are already transforming our coastal landscapes and undermining the resilience of communities and ecosystems. And this was really at, a, um, at the forefront of the key messages in the coastal chapter of the fourth National Climate Assessment, which is still available online. Our job for NCA5 was to look at what is new and what has changed since NCA4. But we found that these three key messages from NCA4 were still incredibly relevant. The big change is that everything has increased in urgency. NCA4 was released in 2018, and over the past five years, we've seen significant changes along our coasts. So our chapter for NCA5 is really aimed at highlighting and amplifying that urgency. We need proactive community-led adaptation strategies along our coast. The pace of adaptation is currently too slow. We need to consider nature-based solutions and also planned relocation that can help move communities out of harm's way. We need to help communities adapt to both current and future increases in the severity of coastal hazards across the United States. And now I'd like to turn it over to Billy to talk about key message one. Hi, thank you, Chris. Hi all, my name is Billy Sweet. I work with NOAA's National Ocean Service. Um, I have been involved in NCA4 and it was a pleasure to be involved in NCA5. Um, really focus on uh, the science of sea level rise and the services surrounding it so that we can uh, help make uh, sound decision-making moving forward. So key message one. Um, as Chris mentioned, and as Mark has mentioned, uh, the impacts of sea level rise and, and a changing climate are, are here now. 
Uh, the severity and risks of these hazards are increasing, largely due to sea level rise and changing storm patterns. It's having an effect on erosion, uh, the height of the groundwater uh, table as it intersects with land. Uh, and, and again, the problems are, are surfacing and they're real. Over the next 30 years, we're expecting as much sea level rise as we've experienced in the last hundred. So that's one of the real takeaways is, you know, history will repeat itself, but unfortunately uh, it's in fast forward. And without action, you know, the risk, the, the flooding, the impacts are likely to occur uh, five to 10 times more often in the next 30 years than they do now, unless action is taken. Next slide, please. All right, so to start, this is uh, showing sea level rise along the uh, contiguous United States, about a foot of sea level rise in the last 100 years. And it just, this image here was the, uh, the, the front page of our 2017 report on sea level rise in the United States. It just shows how precarious a lot of our development is. It's right at the coast uh, with a lot of resources spent to make this the place we want to be and enjoy and, and support commerce, but it's also very risky. Next slide, please. So that's not the only uh, factor affecting our coast. Sea level rise is definitely a very clear signal. It's definitely rising. It's uh, clear at a global to a local level. But when we look at, you know, at the coast, what else is affecting us? We have uh, changes in uh, storm tracks and intensity, uh, rainfalls becoming heavier, uh, increased downpours uh, are flooding communities. Groundwater table is responding to the increase in sea level rise. We have land sinking for natural and unnatural reasons. So there's a host of, of a variety of reasons why our hazards at the coast are increasing. Development is intensifying. We're having more people move to the coast and we have several physical processes, including sea level rise that are also uh, on the rise. And we have a collision course at the coast. Next slide, please. So just this past week in reports out in Marshall Islands in the area of the Pacific of not just due to effects of sea level rise through times, but waves. Um, if this was the West Coast, it could be heavier rains, but uh, there's several factors when they overlap cause severe problems. And this is just a, an image of one of our uh, very important United States uh, defense installations in Kwajalein where we have a tie gauge Big overwash this uh, last week, just sort of showing that, you know, whether it's waves and swell from far or from near, whether it's heavy rains and sea level rise, groundwater increasing due to sea level rise, uh, it's getting riskier to be at the coast. And there's a lot of uh, damage and reports of damage coming out of the Marshall Islands uh, just this last weekend. But there was just a study done here as well saying, you know, sea level rise is, is one of the real problems and flooding is going to, of course, be an issue but it's going to be the contamination of fresh water. Uh, how a lot of these islands get their water is going to be uh, likely the reason why uh, communities are gonna really have to adapt uh, in whatever form or fashion that takes. Next slide, please. Okay, so to put it into perspective, you know, sea level rise is occurring, uh, storm tracks are changing, but how does that affect us at the coast? How do we experience this? How do we humanize the, the effects of rising seas? Uh, in this part of this uh, presentation. So we're gonna use thresholds that mean stuff to us. The weather service and local emergency managers have established thresholds uh, around the community. When waters usually get this high, these types of impacts typically happen. And it reflects our vulnerabilities uh, of our footprint at the coast today used in weather forecasting. You know, am I bringing an umbrella or boots or am I evacuating? You know, we're really starting to try to graduate sort of risk within FEMA's coastal floodplain. You need insurance. Okay, we get it. But we know risk is not the same and there's different severities of flooding. And so about two feet, minor flooding typically occurs, usually disruptive. Three feet, it's oftentimes damaging. Four feet's a major flood and it's, it's, it's oftentimes destructive. So minor, moderate, major, about two, about three, about four feet above today's average high tide line will be thresholds that we will communicate some of the risk moving forward and how that risk has changed. Next slide, please. So already the effects of sea level rise, that same one foot of sea level rise in the one, last 100 years, we've had more than a double the, uh, of high tide flooding, the probability of high tide flooding along the United States coastline as a whole. 
shown here. So this is already happening. Oftentimes it's sunny outside. Oftentimes there is no storm in sight, but sea level rise has closed the gap between our infrastructure uh, and high tide. And now there's a garden variety of reasons why we're flooding, changing prevailing winds, uh, you know, full moon tide, you name it. We're flooding more often and direct response to sea level rise. Next slide, please. So right now, just for snapshots, right? So we're talking about change that's happened and change that's likely to occur or may occur in, in the future slides. But right now, we, we've got to give alerts. And so just to give a picture of what this might look like. So when we uh, cross this minor high tide flood line, let's say in a community here in Annapolis that, I'm, uh, that I, I live in, uh, you know, piers going to water, it's a problem. You got to replace, uh, you know, electrical systems, water systems, if this happens too frequently, which it is. Next click. But if we look downtown Annapolis, water's up to the storefronts. People aren't shopping. It's affecting commerce. They don't want to wait through water to go. And this, these are real uh, reports that have actually, and studies that have shown. Uh, it's, it's a much serious issue. Uh, high tide flooding is already causing a problem in people's uh, communities today. Money's being spent. And so when we look at sea level rise, what does it look like? It's just, it's changing through time. We still have hurricanes, but next click. We see through time that sea level is just inching up closer and closer to where we have things built on land. And for the most part, you know, the American kind of mantras, you know, we don't, we're not retreating, we're staying put. Well, the problem is if we stay put, the water is not, and that's where we're running afoul. Next slide, please. And so if we think of this, it's sort of this bell-shaped curve or Gaussian or, or whatever you call it, uh, 365 days uh, within a year, what is the highest water level? We could think of this analogy of, of being in grade school where you know the, everyone uh, I don't know. The median score was a C. There was a few Fs, a few As, but sort of this normal distribution. Uh, and it hasn't changed too much. Storms sort of come and go. Sea level has not. It's increasing and it's running up against our infrastructure. And we're starting to get to the point, at least where minor flooding occurs, that it's a very nonlinear part of this curve, meaning every increment we move forward, if there's 365 days underneath the area of this curve, we're starting to see that acceleration that we just showed in that last slide. Major flooding is becoming more likely. Um, it's still something that doesn't happen on an annual basis, so it's hard to sort of recognize that, but it too is becoming more likely through time. Next slide, please. So we can show this, the number of days per year with a height above a threshold. That means impact shown here in southwest uh, in California, sort of the San Diego coastline. El Nino is particularly problematic, so there is variability in any given year, but the trend as sea level goes up, flooding is increasing and it's causing problems in our community. And we're starting to map and show areas that are at, uh, potentially at risk of this type of flooding. Next slide. This would be uh, an east coast, this would be in Miami. We're seeing a very large jump in the southeast and east coast in general, and the Gulf for that matter, in terms of flooding. And there's a lot of stuff in its way. Next slide, please. And so when we look to the future, you know, part of this mandate is, you know, what's sea level rise and what are the projections of, of the, the, the things that are really going to help or unfortunately transform society at the coast. Uh, we look at that same hundred year slice on the left and we take sort of the trajectory. Where are we headed? You know, what is the current pathway that sea level rise has taken? And we see that dotted line. That's the other extra foot in the next 30 years. And it sort of lands squarely within these forced scenarios of, of uh, low emissions to high emissions, low heating to high heating. And that's what they represent a span, if you will, by what's plausible by, let's say, 2100 shown here. Um, we, we're trying to establish goalposts to say it could be as low as this or as high as this. It is possible. And if it is possible, certain types of decisions need to know this. And so on a global basis, somewhere between a foot and six feet or so by the end of the century. But when we look at it more nationally shown here, there's vertical land motion. There's other reasons why water's not rising like a bathtub and what's being shown. And we crosswalk this on the right as to what does this mean in terms of temperature? So if we have an increase in global temperature, which we've already had about one or 1 1.3 degrees C above it pre-industrial, you know, how much 
do we expect sea level to rise with these increasing uh, temperatures? And the trajectory of temperature themselves, the commitments that we've made to emissions are somewhere leading us upwards of about three degrees C warming by the end of the century. So that puts us somewhere uh, what we would call here sort of the, the second and third uh, green lines of the intermediate low to intermediate, somewhere between uh, two to three, three to four feet along the United States coastline by the end of the century is where we're sort of headed right now. Um, the yellow at the very far right is this wild card. Um, it's sort of the known unknowns. If the ice sheets really start to deteriorate, uh, disintegrate quicker than anticipated that are really captured in a lot of these models that really try to capture the processes as we understand them and can model them, there is some uncertainty and there's some question as to uh, the, the, the timing of the release of, of primarily uh, ice in Antarctica. So this is where we're going, we're, this is where we're headed. Um, we hope it's not the high scenario. It's probably not the low scenario. It's probably, you know, in these, in sort of in between bound between these lines. But over the next 30 years, we can talk with more confidence and clarity and certainty saying that about a foot of sea level rise as a whole along the United States coastline is where we're headed. So wouldn't count on less than that. There is an annual variability, but we can speak clearly at, at mid-century. Beyond that, there's more uncertainty as to what we collectively are going to do about emissions and global temperatures. Next slide, please. And so we look at how that will actually transform and appear along our coastline. Again, it's not like water rising in a bathtub. We know that the uh, East Coast and Gulf will rise slightly faster than the West Coast. And largely that's due to substance. The land is sinking over most of the East and Gulf Coast. We're in the West Coast, it's a bit more stable. So there's the, we really need to get this information localized because that's how planning typically uh, occurs. And so this is showing the intermediate scenario, again, sort of, which is pretty close to the trajectory we're on at least 2050. So it can give you a sense of, you know, sea level rise of, a foot, foot and a half, maybe two feet in areas of Louisiana where there's very high rates of subsidence, perhaps slightly less on the West Coast, maybe a foot, maybe slightly less. And this is the way uh, that sea level will play out in terms of the other factors, change in circulation, changes in land it, it itself, changes in gravity, if you will, due to redistribution of ice or ice to water as it melts. Next slide, please. So this would be a snapshot um, regionally, just showing out to 2050 with these emission pathways. Um, it's very colorful, but what I would uh, direct your attention to is the black is history. This is measurements. The green is a fit to the measurement and we sort of take that trajectory out to mid-century. And what we see by and large as even though these uh, scenarios really don't diverge much to the end of the century by mid-century, uh, you know, they kind of contained themselves. There's not much difference. So emissions really matter later in the, uh, in terms of where we're headed by the end of the century, but there's already sort of a thermal momentum, if you will, by mid-century saying this is where we are headed. And you can kind of get a sense that again, it's not water in the bathtub, but these are rates that are um, sort of picked right off of similar to the graph we just showed. So you can get a sense of regionally around the country. It's not the same necessarily. A bit higher sea level, let's say in Norfolk than Seattle. Next slide, please. And so in terms of flooding, you know, what are the impacts? And so we, again, we will kind of separate these in terms of minor, moderate, and major. Uh, again, major flooding, it, there's, there's destruction. Things are being ripped out, uh, replaced, it is damaging. Oftentimes it's storm surge. The same would go for the moderate flooding, or the, or the moderate major. Where the minor flooding oftentimes is more tidally driven. So it's more bathtub-like. It's something that's sort of inundating lots of areas where the moder moderate major might be more storm surge. But as we transition to higher sea levels, those two will start to become more frequent, more regular, uh, more tidally driven, more bathtub-like in their effects. And we start to see these uh, leaps and bounds in terms of, uh, of probabilities of flooding as we get 30 years into the future. And so we can see the increases that have already occurred, let's say in minor, moderate, major regional around the country, primarily at East and Gulf Coast is most significant right now. Water moves more often in these areas. And so you're more likely to flood uh, with the West Coast catching up. But 
by 2050 and 30 years from now, again, if we have about a foot of sea level rise, and there's really only about a foot separating between these classifications of flood regime, we're expecting a regime shift. The moderate flooding will take on the frequencies of minor, meaning minor flooding today will become, instead of disruptive, become just outright damaging. And same for moderate to major, even though it'll become less probable still, uh, they are going to, those moderate types of floods will become more major in their impacts with operating under a higher, one foot higher sea level rise. Next slide, please. So in closing, again, let's just give a picture, right? So this would be moderate flooding in Norfolk region, about three feet above mean high water. Um, it's very difficult to get on the naval base, largest naval base in the world. Uh, traffic becomes impeded eight inches or so of the crown of water leading in. This would be a neighborhood outside, just in the vicinity. Again, it is problematic. And the amount of sea level rise that's occurred, let's say just 30 years, this type of event would have had something about every five years or 20% annual chance of occurring any given year. Now it occurs on average about once a year. And just 30 years from now in our headlights, we're looking at five to 10 of, of these types of events per year, the way that our landscape and our, our footprint at the coast. So unless we do something about it, this is the future in 30 years in places like Norfolk. And this is just a snapshot of many different communities around uh, the United States coastline that are going to become increasingly burdened by the impacts of sea level rise. So with that, I will turn it over to my uh, colleague, uh, Renee Collini. Thank you. Thanks, Billy. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Renee Collini, and I'm thrilled to be here. I'm the director of the Gulf Center for Equitable Climate Resilience, located at the Water Institute based out of Louisiana. And I, before that, for 10 years, was with Sea Grant, working along the northern Gulf Coast, helping communities, individuals, nonprofits address and tackle the science that Billy was just presenting and figuring out how to integrate it into meaningful action. So I'm going to go over uh, key message two. Um, you can see here that there's a lot of content, um, just a couple key things to pull out of that key message to jump in. Climate change is reducing the resilience of our ecosystems and our communities. Um, the impacts of climate change is being um, amplified, if you will, by the impacts and the modifications we're making on our coastal systems, reducing their ability to adapt that they naturally would have had. And then the last thing there that we end on, which is a note of hope, is that proactive, informed strategies that consider these interactions will let us move forward in a way to reduce negative impacts on people and systems. So next slide. I just sort of wanted to start out by noting that the coast and our, you know, our natural systems and our people are intertwined. And these are just photos from my own family and our experiences, but you can see there that work, play, our economies, our cultures, our families are all rooted in this. And there's this inextricable link between those systems. Next slide. And so just to kind of illustrate that a little more holistically, we do have these great graphics in our chapter, and I highly recommend you take a look at them. It's actually three panels. And so this first one is just setting up sort of a conceptual coastline, right, and how, where we might see people and communities. And if you look there to number one, you can see cliffs, which had to represent all the different coasts, <laughs> cliffs and staples such as lighthouses and also actions like groins or riprap there at number two. We have our communities on barrier islands and larger cities along the coast. Also looking back inland, we have our natural systems there as well, plus communities and our infrastructure, right? And so you see all these different pieces. And even in this you know, conceptual diagram, you start to get a sense of how inextricably linked all these systems are. And most importantly, how we rely on the natural systems to provide for us. Next slide. And so when we start to think about some of those effects that Billy was talking about, higher sea levels, again, there was a mention of changing storm patterns, those stresses on our natural systems begin to be magnified um, with the things that we're already doing, right? And this is really important because for us, these coastal systems provide things, for example, wetlands provide nursery grounds for fisheries. They help us reduce pollution. Oops, not yet. <laughs> they help us reduce pollution by making sure that they absorb runoff, they collect water, and help us reduce flood risk. And so what happens is these wetlands then are abused by things like runoff and coastal squeeze, 
If you look at sediment disruptions as we move around rivers or interrupt with channels, it starts to change how these systems even access what they need foundationally. So when you layer on top of that things like rising seas and more intense coastal storms, as these wetlands move through that, go ahead and move the wetlands through it, <laughs> you see that our systems become degraded. In this case, when we're talking about wetlands, they get lost completely or they don't function as well. And that starts to have this feedback loop onto our coastal systems where we're not getting nursery grounds, where we aren't getting as much protection, they're not reducing as much pollution, uh, other things they do. And it's not just wetlands that do this, barrier islands, oyster reefs, coral reefs, there's a wide array of these systems in which we live near and work near, and it's really critical that we understand how they're changing and that they are changing rapidly. Next slide. So if you go back to this graphic, this is what it would look like and sort of what we're starting to experience, and as Billy was saying, we can see very soon, probably in the next 20 to 30 years. And if you look across, you see our natural, our protection that we'd already put in, those groins, those riprap's are underwater, now the cliff is at risk, the cities are flooding. And if you look back at number three, that's actually groundwater coming up from underground, being pushed up by the pressures of rising seas. You couple that with extreme rainfall events, you start to get compound flooding, multiple sources of flooding impacting inland areas, not just coastal or immediately adjacent to the water. If you look at number four there, the riverine flooding goes up, it starts to get into these natural systems, but also compromise our infrastructure. And so for the next slide, this is really important. Mark talked about at the beginning that it's coastal issues don't stay on the coast, right? We're a major part of the GDP, but also 60 million people almost are employed in these coastal areas. And if you look at the things that that economy rests on, it's all things that help move inland, right? Goods and services, places for people inland to come, recreation and tourism, fisheries. And I know there's plenty of people in the middle of the country who like to eat good fish. And you see that there's lots of connection here across the country. And it's really important that we understand how these changes are gonna impact people and these, and these systems on which we rely. Next slide. So when we start to talk about what this flooding means for people specifically, we do have a few examples we pulled out in the chapter. You can see some of them here. And it's things that I don't think any of us are strangers to. Interruption of energy provision, disruption of transportation, infrastructure, emergency services, displacement of people, either temporary or permanent in the face of these larger events. But also again, that loss of ecosystem, these storms can disrupt those natural systems as well. It's not just our, our homes and our built infrastructure, but that natural system as well. Next slide. But something that Billy touched on is it's not just the big storms that are changing. It's these chronic impacts that are continuing to occur more and more frequently have this impact in lots of ways. Um, I, I like the phrase, I used to say death by a thousand cuts, but that's really dramatic. I really prefer actually no single raindrop thinks that they cause a flood, right? <laughs> And you, so you start to get all these individual little events that start to add up. And so, for example, if you think about just a few minutes delay of emergency response, right, for homes that may be on fire, that could be the difference between success or not. Or if you think about the real estate values and our commerce declining, crop productivity declining, it starts to get at issues of food insecurity. And public health is actually really important when it comes to these chronic issues. If you think about septic tanks, but even centralized wastewater systems are not as effective as we see these changing, uh, these changing issues. And in particular, um, one thing I hadn't thought about until recently, is you think about the high tide flooding Billy was discussing, think about what's in that water. And we're not really thinking about or talking about that, for example, at the dog park, what might be in there, or if trash cans get knocked over. So there's all these little ways that these things start to magnify. And we discuss in the chapter how we feel like this is just as important, if not more important, than some of these acute events. Next slide. But not every individual and not every community is going to experience the effects of this change in hazards the same. And there are other chapters that talk about this in depth in terms of disproportionate impacts, but it's really worth noting that the disproportionate impacts on the coast translate to different things. And some of that comes from the fact that flood protection measures are not invested in equally or everywhere. Some of it comes from lack of economic opportunity or disparities in wealth. But as we start to dig in, you can see that this translates to things that some folks in our community may have declined in food and job security, these hazards change things. Talking about home affordability and availability, we discuss in the chapter how insurance prices are rising rapidly without consideration for how and why and where people live and how they ended up there. And so it's leading to forms of gentrification and pushing people of low and moderate incomes, not just off the water, but out of coastal parishes, counties, and communities 
completely. But uh, that doesn't mean <laughs> that while we're seeing these effects already, that it has to continue in this way and at the intensity that we've been talking about. We talk about mitigation and adaptation in MCA5, both of which that can help reduce some of these impacts as we look forward into the future. So if you go to the next slide, I'm going to kind of go in opposite order. We've landed on disproportionate impacts. And so one way when we think about taking action is making sure it's informed. And it's informed across a variety of things, including thinking about environmental justice, thinking about the community. This uh, is actually from chapter 20. There's a lot of intersections with other chapters for the coast. But if you look here, there's considerations of recognitional, distributional, and procedural equity. And by considering these different aspects, such as who is deciding what or who gets how much or why does it matter, we can start to tease apart how our actions can make sure that those disproportionate impacts are realized and addressed before it gets there. Next slide. In addition to thinking about the social aspects and environmental aspects, aspects we discussed quite a lot in this chapter how our shorelines are dynamic and they interact and they change, right? And so here's just a graphic, an example from Dr. Pasiri and her team's work where they actually dug into how the shoreline will change with these small incremental changes with sea level rise and then looked at storm surge on top of that. And so by being able to integrate these different processes and systems together, we now have a better representation of what flood risk will look like in the future than if we had just taken a static look at it. And then from there, next slide, Another team was able to come behind that and work with Dr. Pasiri's team, a team led by Dr. Del Angel, where they pull out, what does it mean for people? Where are their risks for displacement, permanent and temporary? Where are their risks to the building stock? Because we already have challenges with housing. And you can see that it's not just a long sum, but breaking down geographically where those risks are different and where they have a greater impact on the population. And then they even layered in issues such as income, uh, job opportunities, speak, you know, English speaking families, working through some of these issues that we know exacerbate this disproportionate impact. So we have opportunities to take pro proactive and informed action and in making sure that is a comprehensive and holistic way. We'll really make sure we reduce those negative impacts moving forward. And so to give you more details about what that looks like, Chris is gonna tell you about key, key message three, which was uh, my favorite one. <laughs> well, they're all our favorite key messages. Um... Hi, it's Chris again, and I'm going to talk about key message three, which focuses on adaptation, because adaptation can reduce the risk um, and provide additional benefits for coastal communities. So we've already talked about how accelerating sea level rise and climate, climate change are already transforming our coastal la landscapes. And this is really going to require a new paradigm for how we live with or adapt to these changes over time. A lot of adaptation is currently incremental in nature, but nature-based solutions and planned relocation strategies may really help communities adapt to these hazards, particularly if they are community-led and equity-centered. Maintaining those cultural and economic connections with coastal communities is gonna require equitable transformative adaptation that really addresses systemic interconnections between ecosystems, communities, and governance. Oh, thing didn't work. All right. Why is it not going to the next slide for me now? All right. So I want to start with going back to the very beginning of when we held a stakeholder working group um, across the country. We had invited the public to our meetings. Um, to find out what they really wanted us to focus on in the coastal chapter for NCA5. Um, and it really came about that coastal communities are really valued places for living and working. Um, and we used Padlet for people to tell us what they loved so much about the coast. Um, and I'm just showing you just a couple of the things that people were posting. Um, but people love the coast. It's, it's calming. They love the food. They love the culture. It finds them peace. Um, and on and on, people had no problem telling us how much of a connection of place they had to our coastlines. And so finding ways to adapt our coastal communities so that people can continue to live and work along the coast um, is really important for us to achieve. 
The good news, now this is a graphic from chapter 31, which is adaptation. As Renee mentioned, there's a ton of crossover across our chapters. So it's really great if you dive into the online version where we can't go into detail on a topic, we'll send you right over to another chapter. Um, but this, this graphic shows you how much adaptation activities are already going on across our country. And there is a lot of adaptation activities, particularly along our coastal communities. But this graphic is showing adaptation activities, not necessarily adaptation implementation. Adaptation activities can include um, awareness building and vulnerability assessments and planning. And what we need to do is move more into um, adaptation like implementation. Um, and move past just the planning assessments, but we really need to do it in a proactive and transformative way. Currently, our adaptation activities are just not keeping pace with accelerated sea level rise. And these increasing and compounding hazards that Billy mentioned, they are now affecting much larger geographic areas, requiring much more complex solutions at larger scales, and they are increasing the number and diversity of people at risk along our shoreline. <clears throat> so most of the adaptation that we're taking is incremental in nature, which is okay, but it's not leading us to a future where we need to get where adaptation is more transformative. So adaptation that is incremental in nature typically has a bias towards preserving the status quo, holding the line, keeping our communities the way we are um, at, because we are often resilient to change. It may include minor shifts in our business as usual practices. It may only cover a small geographic area. It often only addresses one single hazard, such as rising seas and coastal storm surge, and it forgets to consider those companion hazards of that increased rainfall and rising groundwater. Um, I'm living in the Bay Area and I can tell you right now, um, we have downpouring rains, we have higher than normal tides due to El Nino, and the sub pump in my basement stopped working, so I have groundwater intrusion happening. So as we adapt the area where we live, I really want them to consider um, well, and I'm working on it, multiple hazards. We can't just address single hazards. And we also, um, incremental adaptation often has that limited ability to really be across multiple sectors, and it often suffers from technical, social, and economic barriers. So where we want to tend towards, move towards, is really transformative adaptation. Adaptation that uses a systems approach to go across multiple sectors. So it's going across transportation and water and wastewater and the natural environments and, and open spaces and parks. We want a transformation that really adapt addresses the root cause of coastal, coastal vulnerabilities and considers multiple and compound hazards. And most importantly, transformative adaptation needs to be inclusive of the needs of diverse stakeholders. It needs to involve everyone in the decision-making process of how we want our communities to change. And it needs to center equity and address historical injustices. And one of the best ways to achieve transformative adaptation is to involve the community and allow the community to help lead the adaptation process so that we can develop communities that we all want to live in um, together that maintain the things that we love and want to keep about living near the coast. So this is another graphic from chapter 31 on adaptation. So there's a lot of different adaptations that are available to us, a suite of options that we can kind of put into this filter. But there are numerous inputs that we need to consider as we're trying to figure out the best adaptations of our, for our community, those best outcomes. 
We need to consider our community culture, our history, our social capital, and our values, and also different risk perceptions and tolerance. In the United States, we often use a FEMA perspective where we don't want to get wet. We want to keep all of the hazards at bay, but we may need to learn to lift with some water and change some of our risk tolerance over time. And there's a suite of decision-making criteria that go into the process of selecting the right adaptation options. Um, and we need to involve the entire community, um, their preferences, our overall cap capabilities and capacity building, the resources, and involve everyone in the process to get to a suite of equitable adaptation options. So this is again um, the graphic that Renee showed of this coastal community experience um, a myriad of the of the um, of the coastal hazards from riverine flooding, from higher groundwater, from our city being flooded by coastal storm surge, um, erosion beginning to occur along the coast. When we look across the systems approach and address all of these hazards. Um, this is what one outcome could look like. So on number one, we relocated the community inland and we transformed this area into more of a park with some limited pedestrian access over time. Instead of trying to continue to maintain this like barrier island spit type area for people to live. And number six, we put in an ecological seawall that can protect the community while also providing adaptation um, benefits and ecological benefits. Number seven, we relocated the lighthouse inland um, instead of allowing it to sit on the edge of the cliff. On number five, the rising groundwater is there. And rather than trying to add pump stations and take more power, we're allowing the rising brine water to live there and we relocated the power system inland and we diversified from fossil fuels and we went to a wind farm and different sources of power. Um, so when you couple a wide variety of solutions together, this is, and work with the community, this is providing more of a systems approach and it's accommodating planned relocation and reducing the impacts of climate change on the coastal community. So this is another example of trying to look at a broad suite of hazards. Um, and so this is a case study in our chapter on um, the Ohio Creek watershed, looking at both the present and future state. So that top panel is showing conditions before project implementation. There were challenges with groundwater infiltration and a rising groundwater table, with areas along the coast with storm surge and flooding, with overland flooding um, from precipitation and, and runoff. And now at the bottom panel, this is some potential expected conditions after project implementation. So in this situation, um, see if this works. Um, they did build um, more of a structure along the edge to help protect, protect from the coastal flooding. Um, and they are allowing for uh, more infl uh, infiltration and built a resilience park that this is an area that can be flooded over time with restored creek, um, creek tidal plains and bioswales to help address and deal with the precipitation and runoff. And here they did build a raised structure for their main transportation corridor to allow that to remain out of the flooding. So now this is just one example that's combining a suite of both traditional engineered and um, green infrastructure and ecological habitats um, to help make the overall community more resilient um, to climate change. So I just want to finish by saying that this is just, um, you're hearing from us, um, from Renee and Billy and from Mark Osler. We're just really a small cross section of the entire set of the chapter team from across the country that really worked on this for many years together including our technical contributors and our review editors.
and our USGCRP coordinators that helped lead us all along the entire way with many points of input from the public and review communities to develop our chapter. Um, it's all available online, um, so you can access our chapter and the entire full chapter online and all of, um, all of really NCA5. It's very easy to read and jump around, and I encourage you all um, to take a chance to see it. And before I turn it over to QA on the Coastal Chapter, I'm going to take a few minutes to go through the Blue Carbon Chapter, because Blue Carbon is really very well tied to the Coast Chapter, since Blue Carbon, um, Blue Carbon is, um, you know, is related to our coastal ecosystems. So the one thing that's really great is this is the very first time that blue carbon has been part of the national climate assessment. The author teams across all of NCA5, um, we nominated different topics that we wanted to include in NCA5 for the first time that hadn't been covered before. And blue carbon was one of many things that were nominated like compound events and the supply chains. Um, that we talked about at the very beginning. So the author team for Blue Carbon was pulled from different chapters from across NCA5 to do not a full chapter, but just provide an introduction into Blue Carbon. So what is Blue Carbon? <laughs> Blue Carbon refers to that carbon that's captured by marine ecosystems um, along our coastlines. And so those are primarily mangroves, coastal wetlands, and seagrasses. So this is a photo of mangroves along a coastal um, environment. So why blue carbon is, it's been gaining such international interest really for a, a decade or more, because acre for acre, these systems can sequester about twice as much carbon below ground than terrestrial vegetation, meaning our trees and stuff that's on land. So these coastal environments that interface between land and the ocean is a, a truly valuable ecosystems to sequester carbon um, while also providing tons of other ecosystem benefits and supporting livelihoods around the, around the world. So it's a potential natural um, climate mitigation option with enhanced stewardship, management, conservation, and restoration of these ecosystems. Blue carbon ecosystems could sequester enough carbon each year to offset about 3% of our global emissions. Now, 3% might not sound like a lot, but this is based on emissions in 2019 and 2020. Um, and if we can continue to reduce our greenhouse gas, gas emissions as a global community, and we take care of these systems and enhance and restore them, then there's a, a significant potential that these can be valuable for allowing us to have a more sustainable future. So this compares kind of the amount of carbon sequestration below ground for mangroves, coastal wetlands, and seagrasses. So mangroves have the most uh, carbon sequestration potential below ground. Um, and so there's been a lot of attention on restoring the, these ecosystems. Um, Unfortunately, these ecosystems are also extremely vulnerable to climate change. Climate change, including sea level rise and the increased coastal hazards that we've been talking about, they are the greatest threat to our coasts. And that's where these coastal ecosystems um, are surviving. Currently, about 43 to 48% of our tidal wetlands on the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts are vulnerable to sea level rise. The northern wetlands are usually limited by their inland migration capacity. Either we have built infrastructure such as roadways that are not allowing wetlands to like naturally migrate inland, or we have natural features such as cliffs and bluffs that are not allowing these to migrate inland. In the southern part of our country, wetlands are often limited by that local subsidence. 
Um, Billy showed us that the Gulf Coast has the highest rate of that local rel um, relative local sea level rise, and that's in large part due to subsidence, due to oil and gas um, extraction. And so that increases the relative rate of local sea level rise and puts those wetlands at greater risk of not keeping pace with sea level rise. Um, blue carbon ecosystems um, are also at extreme risk of disappearing due to human disturbance, due to development, um, due to um, farming practices, due to filling, um, filling those wetlands for development. And continued disturbance can lead to these negative blue carbon climate change feedbacks as these systems are eroded and degraded. We can be reducing their car carbon storage potential instead of increasing it. Eroding these systems can actually release that stored carbon and methane, increasing the amount of emissions that are going out into the atmosphere therefore increasing the rate of ecosystem deg degradation. So protecting these areas to support carbon sequestration can really have cascading ecological and societal benefits, not just in the US, but throughout the entire global community, which is why there is such a focus, I think, on protecting these and finding ways to incentivize communities to um, enhance and restore these ecosystems. And so again, we had a, a lovely author team that um, contributed to pulling this together. It's a much shorter chapter. My federal coordinating lead author was the director of NCA5, Allison Crimmins, and it was um, an honor to work with her and technical contributors that were pulled for that pulled from the adaptation chapter and the oceans chapter and the ecosystems chapter, as well as some of the regional chapters that have um, support a bevy of our blue carbon ecosystems that we have as a country. And you can find this chapter on um, the global change website chapter focus on five. Um, and I hope you all take a